At the end of the First Tiberium War, GDI became the sole military and economic superpower on the planet. Though this did not mean there weren't any threats that required GDI's attention. While the Brotherhood's leader Kane had been killed, causing internal fighting amongst its senior officers, the organization still proved to be a thorn in GDI's side. Raids and other acts of terror, such as the nuking of the Global Peace Conference, and the destruction of GDI-friendly villages in not controlled Africa, meant that GDI would need to continue to invest heavily in its military. With this investment came the development of many advanced weapon systems, including various armed mechanical walkers never before seen. Actually, GDI experimented with a prototype mech walker during the First Tiberium War, called the Exo Power Suit. This suit stood about 10 feet tall, and weighed around 2,000 pounds. It was armed with a 20 milliwatt laser and 35 millimeter rocket launcher. The operator seemed to climb into the suit from the top, and then became encased entirely inside it. The suit was intended to be, quote, used in covert military scenarios requiring quick and efficient offensive strategies, with the ability to take out full mechanized opposition. The Exo power suit would never get past the experimental phase, and by then, the First Tiberium War had ended. But the technology and knowledge GDI scientists and engineers learned from its development would go on to be used in future mechwalkers, particularly the Wolverine. During the Second Tiberium War, the Wolverine replaced GDI's Humvees as their primary light vehicle. The Wolverine shared many similarities with the original Exo power suit. One could even say that it was the completed version of the Exo, with its official name being Powered Assault Armor. This 8-9 to nine foot bipedal walker was piloted by a single soldier, who could see out the small slit near the top of it. The viewing slit also seemed to be part of the hatch for the pilot to enter and exit the vehicle. A couple of handlebars are located on the front, perhaps to help the pilot climb atop the Wolverine. Just to the left of the hatch was a headlamp for the operator to see at night, or in other low-light conditions. Next to this headlamp was an antenna for the vehicle's radio. The Wolverine was equipped with two belt-fed miniguns attached to each arm. These guns were effective at taking out enemy infantry and light vehicles, though they weren't much use against more heavily armored ones. Thanks to its armor, the Wolverine protected the pilot from most light arms weapons. Laser weapons were especially effective against the Wolverine though, as they could cut through its armor with ease. The Wolverine was quite fast and agile for a bipedal walker, making it a cheap scouting vehicle for GDI commanders. More importantly, it could walk over the veins of a Vainhull monster without agitating the creature, thus avoiding destruction. In addition, the Wolverine was vulnerable to enemy aircraft, as the walker couldn't bring its miniguns to bear against them. The Wolverine excelled at suppressing fire and light skirmishes. A squad of Wolverines could handle large groups of enemy infantry, and even do decent damage to light vehicles. When it came to all-purpose assault and defense, GDI utilized the medium battle mechanized walker, better known as the Titan. By the time of the Second Tiberium War, the Titan had replaced nearly all the medium tanks in GDI's arsenal. The Titan stood 25 feet tall. There were a couple of hatches on top of the vehicle's, quote, head, for the crew or single crewman to enter and exit. A small light is located in front of the square hatch. What appear to be smoke grenade launchers are located on each side of the Titan's head, though they have no in-game function. I'm not exactly sure what this large, square-shaped device on top of the Titan's head is supposed to be, but it does remind me of the infrared searchlight that could be seen on M60 Patton tanks so perhaps the one on the Titan performs a similar function. Two radio antennas can also be seen protruding from the head. On the front of the Titan's main body are two more large lights. The main body itself could rotate 360 degrees, even while moving. Attached to the left, or from the Titan's perspective, right side of the body, is the walker's primary weapon, a 120mm cannon capable of taking out enemy armor and base structures. One advantage to the Titan's height was that it could fire over walls, able to hit enemy units attacking a GDI base, or over the walls of a Nod base. The 120mm cannon could outrange the Brotherhood's standard laser turret, allowing the Titan to destroy the turret from a safe distance. Any enemy infantry that got close to the Titan could be stepped on by the Walker's legs. However, it was more practical for a GDI commander to support their Titans with Wolverines, which could more effectively deal with infantry. 
The Titan's legs enabled it to cross various terrains, albeit at a slow pace. The exception to this was terrain that was covered by a vein hole monster, as the weight of the Titan would agitate the creature's veins, causing it to attack the walker. As powerful and intimidating as the Titan could be, it did have its own share of weaknesses. The walker's slow movement meant it could take some time for it to reach a designated location. This could be remedied by having a carry-all airlift the Titan. The walker was unable to target enemy aircraft, so it needed constant anti-air support. While the Titan could outrange the Brotherhood's standard laser turrets, it was vulnerable to Nod's Obelisks of Light, whose high-powered laser could slice through the walker's armor with ease. To deal with Obelisks of Light from afar, and lay siege to bases, GDI developed the Juggernaut as its primary mobile artillery walker. Unlike the Wolverine and Titan, the Juggernaut was created during the Second Tiberium War, as GDI found themselves lacking in long-range artillery support. GDI engineers took the chassis of the Titan, widened it, and attached bigger legs to the sides. They then attached a larger body to the chassis that could handle the three 120mm cannons armed onto the walker. The configuration of these cannons was similar to the triple gun turrets seen on battleships. Before firing, the Juggernaut would take a few seconds to deploy a third support leg that would help ground the vehicle in place. This prevented the walker from being toppled over by the recoil generated by the three 120mm cannons. When deployed, the Juggernaut's turret could rotate 360 degrees to fire at enemies in all directions. The Juggernaut was an effective all-terrain siege unit for GDI, able to break Nod base structures crumbling to the ground from a safe distance, away from any defenses or Nod's own mobile artillery vehicles. The Juggernaut didn't fire all its guns at once, instead firing them one after the other. While this made the walker less accurate against a single target in comparison to Nod's mobile artillery, it was more effective against a group of units. A single Juggernaut famously supported a Ghost Stalker, Archaeologist, and Medic in recovering a fragment of the Tacitus within a Tiberium jungle in Bolivia. The Juggernaut had a long reload time, and the vehicle not only had a maximum range, but a minimum one too. The walker couldn't fire on enemy units next to it, though it could step on infantry that failed to get out of its way. Because of this, it was imperative that the Juggernaut be supported by friendly units. Like the Titans, the Juggernaut was slow moving, though it could be airlifted by a carryall. The Juggernaut was unable to fire while mobile, and he had to avoid stepping on the veins of a vein hole monster. While GDI scientists and engineers had made great strides in mechwalker development, they wanted to continue pushing the limits. This would culminate in the replacement of the famous mammoth tank used during the First Tiberian War with a giant four-legged prototype walker called the Mammoth Mark II. While the Mammoth Walker was still in its testing phase during the Second War, GDI needed to deploy what few prototypes they had to counter the Brotherhood of Nod on the battlefield. The Mammoth Mark II was by far the largest mechwalker in GDI's arsenal. It was also the most heavily armed and armored. Right under the head of the vehicle was a ball turret with twin cannons and a light, useful against infantry and light vehicles. This weapon has no in-game function though. A searchlight sits just atop the head of the walker. Attached to the left and right side of the Mark II's body were its main weapons, four massive railguns, two on each side. Above the railguns, near the back side of the vehicle's body, were two anti-air missile launchers carrying eight missiles each. While some of the Mark II's weapons were probably automated, I imagine the Mark II would still need several crew members to operate it. This would include a couple of mechanics who could repair some of the damage the vehicle sustained during combat. The Mammoth Mark II's first military action during the Second Tiberium War was to aid Michael McNeil in destroying a Nod production center tasked with building their new Banshee aircraft. This proved to be a major victory for GDI, as the Banshee's plasma weapons were effective at bringing down a Mark II Walker. Of course, unlike other GDI mech walkers, the Mark II could actually defend itself against aircraft, thanks to its heat-seeking AA missiles. The Mark II's railguns could instantly reduce most vehicles to slag in a matter of seconds. They could even pierce through multiple infantry in a row. Structures wouldn't last long against the walker's railguns either. The walker's thick armor meant it could take a lot of damage before being destroyed, though if it survived an engagement, its crew would repair what damage they could. 
While the Mark II could certainly handle itself in a fight, it still needed supporting units around it, as losing one was expensive to replace. Just like the Titan and Juggernaut, the Mammoth Mark II was slow moving and had to avoid Banehole monsters. It could be airlifted by a carryall. However, I believe this is just a function of gameplay, as the carryall doesn't seem large or powerful enough to actually lift the Mark II with its ducted fans. Instead, I think it makes more sense that the dropship would be able to lift the Mark II, as it was larger and was equipped with more powerful jet engines. GDI continued to make use of their full arsenal of mechanized walkers until the end of the Second Tiberium War and resulting Firestorm Crisis. While the Brotherhood of Nod had been defeated a second time, GDI could no longer ignore the crisis caused by Tiberium's proliferation and transformation of the Earth's natural environment. To combat this, GDI reallocated its funds from military spending to environmental. This meant the organization's military could no longer afford to build and maintain their arsenal of mech walkers, which were also deemed temperamental on the battlefield. The advantages conferred by their all-terrain capabilities were offset by their cost, poor reliability, and easily exploited vulnerabilities. The Wolverines would be replaced with Guardian APCs. This APC could perform the role of anti-infantry vehicle with its single machine gun, while also being able to transport infantry. The Titans would be replaced with the new MBT-6 Predator tank. While lacking the range and armor of the Titan, the Predator was cheap to produce and maintain. In addition, the Predator was able to move faster across the battlefield, while packing more firepower with its 150mm cannon. The Mammoth Mark II would be discontinued and replaced with the new Mammoth Mark III. The Mark III Mammoth would not be a walker though. Instead, its design would be based off the original Mammoth Mark I tank from the First Tiberium War. This was a controversial decision, as many believed the Mark II was integral in helping GDI win the Second Tiberium War. It was a sad day for many today, as the last Mammoth Mark II walker to enter active combat duty flanked its way out of GDI's San Pedro War Factory and into history. With its twin railguns, battlefield dominance, and unusual boxy profile, the Mark II became an iconic symbol of freedom during the Second Tiberium War. Its discontinuation has been greeted by many with anger. Notably, Captain Nick Havoc Parker, retired war hero, popular conservative pundit, and noted proponent of the Kane Lives theory. With protests held at containment areas several miles away, the mood at the factory was more resigned than angry. Production of the controversial new 4-tread Alterade Mark III is scheduled to take place in far-off Reykjavik, with many in San Pedro fearing for their jobs and the future of their community. The only place for people to see the original Titan Mechwalkers and Mammoth Mark IIs were out in the Yellow Zones, where the husks of ones destroyed during the Second War lay to rest, their parts having been scavenged by those that live out in such zones. Not all mechanized walkers were phased out of GDI's arsenal, though. During GDI's transition from being a military-focused organization to a Tiberium abatement-focused one, General Joshua Mitch Mitchell successfully argued to allocate funding for the creation of an experimental combat division led by himself. This division, dubbed the Steel Talons, became popular for their skirmishes against Nod Splinter factions and their use of new advanced weapon systems, including upgrades to the Wolverine and Titan Mechwalkers of the Second War. The Wolverine continued to play an integral role as an anti-infantry walker in the Steel Talons' arsenal. Steel Talons rule! While the Steel Talons utilized the new Guardian APC, they replaced its machine gun with a crane, so that it acted more as a frontline repair vehicle. The, what I'll just refer to as the Mark II, Wolverine, was a little bigger compared to its Second War counterpart. It was upgraded with more powerful legs that allowed it to move across the battlefield faster. The main body was noticeably wider compared to the previous one, providing a little more space for the pilot inside. The Mark II was still armed with a single minigun on both arms, which could quickly mow down enemy infantry. They could even do a decent amount of damage to light armored vehicles such as Nod's attack bikes and buggies. The weapons could be upgraded to carry AP ammo from the command post. This made the Wolverine more effective at taking out light ground vehicles, while also doing a decent amount of damage to structures, especially if it came in the form of concentrated fire from a pack of Wolverines. Like its predecessor, the Mark II Wolverine wouldn't last long in a straight-up fight against Nod laser turrets or a group of Scorpion tanks, 
as it still only used light armor to maintain its movement speed. Unlike other mechanized walkers, the Wolverines could be airlifted by the new V-35 UX transport, which replaced the carry-all and dropship as GDI's primary transport aircraft after the Second War. While the Steel Talons also made use of Bloodhound reinforcements, they would replace the two Guardian APCs with Wolverines. Instead of using the new Predator medium tank, the Steel Talons opted to upgrade their fleet of Titan mech walkers. Titan, armored and ready. The Titan Mark II was about the same size as the original Mark I, though it featured an overall blockier design. The head of the vehicle could rotate vertically down when in an idle state. When engaged in combat or on alert, the head would rotate up to be horizontal with the walker's body. As for its armament, the Mark II Titan seemed to use a more powerful main gun, perhaps the same 150mm used by the Predator tanks. When not in use, the gun would fold and become, quote, tucked in under the Titan's body. Thanks to its improved legs, the Titan Mark II could make its way across the battlefield a little faster than the Mark I. While slower than the Predator, the Mark II had greater armor, packed more firepower, and gave the operator a high vantage point to spot targets further away. Of course, such a tall walker was also easily spotted from a distance. Like its predecessor, the Mark II excelled at taking out armored vehicles and base structures. Its stronger legs even allowed it to crush smaller vehicles in its way. More importantly though, the Mark II could be upgraded with new experimental technologies to further enhance its combat capabilities. The Titan's main cannon could be replaced with a more powerful railgun. Railguns could easily penetrate armored vehicles and structures, in addition to being more accurate against enemy infantry units. This would be especially useful against enemy commandos, who could plant C4 explosives on a Titan's legs and bring the walker collapsing to the ground. With railguns came the ability for Titans to accelerate them. This acceleration enabled the Titans to fire their railguns at a faster rate, but at the cost of causing damage to the walker itself, due to the excess heat that was generated. This damage could be mitigated if the Titans were retrofitted with experimental adaptive armor. One could recognize a vehicle outfitted with adaptive armor, thanks to the blue panels fitted all around its body. When activated, a blue colored field surrounds the vehicle. While on, the adaptive armor negates the damage the Titan receives from all sources, though this comes at the cost of slowing the Titan's rate of fire. Adaptive armor also allows the Titan to ignore the disabling effects of an EMP blast. Mark II Titans were still vulnerable to attacks from aircraft, so it was imperative that they be supported by anti-air vehicles such as the Slingshot. Titans would often find their legs damaged during combat engagements. One could tell how severe the damage was based off how much a Titan limped when it walked. The one mechanized walker that would end up remaining in the standard GDI arsenal was the Juggernaut. I'm the Juggernaut! The original vehicle made for an excellent mobile artillery unit, one that was worth continued production and development despite its high cost. Since it was intended for indirect fire support well behind the front lines, the advantages conferred by all-terrain navigation were deemed worthy of the risks. The Mark III Juggernaut mobile artillery system was based off the Titan Mark II chassis. It sported a new turret with upgraded cannons, a crew pod attached to the left side of the vehicle, and a next-generation fire control system for faster reloads and better acquisition of distant targets. The Mark III Juggernaut replaced the third leg of the Mark I with what I'll just call support heels, which helped to stabilize the walker when firing its three cannons. All three cannons would typically fire one after the other in quick succession, with their shells landing sparsed out. The Juggernaut could rotate its turret 360 degrees even while moving, though it had to stand still in order to fire. It was still effective at laying siege to enemy bases and eliminating units that were bunched up together. Fast attack vehicles like Nod's attack bikes and buggies were agile enough to dodge the shells. GDI sniper teams could spot targets nearby and call in a bombardment on the location. Bombardment enables the Juggernaut to fire at distant targets, completely out of its field of view. The bombardment would last several seconds, with the Juggernauts firing each cannon one by one. Depending on the number of Juggernauts contributing to the bombardment, they would quickly topple enemy base structures with great accuracy. The Mark III Juggernaut inherited the weaknesses of its predecessor, such as being unable to engage enemy units at close range. 
though it could use its improved legs to crush most vehicles beneath it. Like the Steel Talon's Titans, the Juggernaut had to watch out for enemy commandos who could plant explosives on its legs and bring it crashing to the ground. Down Juggernauts would leave behind a husk that could be recruited and fixed up by a GDI engineer. However, enemy engineers, such as Nod Saboteurs or the Skrin's Assimilators, could also repair and recrew the Juggernaut, putting it to use against GDI. To prevent this from happening, it was better for the husk to be destroyed by nearby GDI forces. GDI engineers eventually got fed up with losing Juggernauts in close combat, and sought to remedy that weakness by making a new version of the Walker. While an essential part of the GDI arsenal, the limited weapon payload of the Juggernaut mobile artillery walkers left the vehicle uniquely vulnerable to close-range engagement. After one too many Juggernauts were rendered a smoldering heap by little more than a non-infantry regiment, a frustrated GDI engineering corps jury-rigged an infantry-capable garrison pod onto the walker's chassis. The end result was so successful, not to mention devastating to the ill-fated Nod Recon patrols that came across it, that this updated walker, nicknamed the Behemoth, was soon approved for full development. After a period of field testing with the Steel Talons, the Behemoth is expected to provide long-range artillery support across the globe. Behemoth emerging! The garrison pod of the Behemoth was attached to the very back of the walker, right above the middle gun. All infantry roles in the Steel Talons division could garrison this bunker. Riflemen were excellent at dealing with enemy infantry attempting to get close and sabotage the walker's legs. Grenadiers could clear garrison buildings as the behemoth passed by them. Missile squads dealt with any ground vehicles or aircraft attacking the walker. And combat engineers just got a safe ride to any nearby structure they needed to capture. Since the Steel Talons didn't make use of snipers, the Behemoth was unable to conduct a bombardment against far-off enemy positions. While the Behemoth was expected to replace the standard Juggernaut after its field testing, this change ultimately did not come to pass. Standard GDI divisions would continue to use the Juggernaut, while the Steel Talons maintained their arsenal of Behemoths. The future of mechanized walkers in GDI's arsenal after the Third Tiberium War is in an interesting state. On one hand, mechwalkers could continue to be relegated to specific roles, either as long-range mobile artillery platforms like the Juggernaut, or as part of the Steel Talon's Experimental Combat Technology Division. On the other hand, GDI might look to reintroduce mechwalkers as an essential component of their arsenal, largely due to the Skrid invasion and the aliens' use of their own Annihilator tripod walkers. In the event of another Skrin invasion, and the ability to reverse engineer the alien technology that was left behind, mechanized walkers could one day return as a distinct and vital aspect of GDI's armed forces. <laughs>